Just give a brief introduction to General Mills, who's uh, been kind enough to join us here this morning and talk about his uh, recent tour, just concluded three weeks ago in Afghanistan, where he was the uh, commander of Regional Command Southwest, which is an area of operations, as you might expect, in the southwest of Afghanistan. I'm very astute here on Monday mornings, so I hope you are as well. The, uh, that, that's the first, uh, in, in effect, marine area of operations in Afghanistan and was uh, stood up here, uh, as I recollect, uh, in uh, the early 08 time frame and it is now uh, come into uh, full full fledged there with the uh, other regional commands. So he was the senior U.S. Marine in Afghanistan uh, during his time out there. As I, as I look at Briefly talk about South, the RC Southwest, the southwest corner of Afghanistan. That was my world for the past 12 months. That's what I was responsible for. That's where I focused. I, I can give you some uh, opinions of the rest of Afghanistan if you want to ask those questions, but that would be opinion and not, not personal observation. This is, this is all personal observation. Just, just a real quick background. Um, Marines had 10,000 Marines in there, a medley, a Marine Expeditionary Brigade in there for the, as part of the coalition forces uh, prior to the surge. And that's what we intended to have all of that. So in 2009, during the summer, I was the CG of 1st Marine Division and very happy in my job. Uh, in December, uh, when, uh, President Obama made his decision to surge. Uh, Marine uh, forces were doubled to 20,000. Uh, I got a call that there was going to be a two-star two command, and so I would be, uh, I, my, my, my staff and I would go forward. We were also told that we would morph into a NATO command and uh, a little later in the year. So I joined a British Brigadier as my, uh, as my deputy, and about 120 very, very skilled uh, UK officers who came over were experienced in NATO operations and some other service officers to, make, to flush out a, a full NATO staff for the time that we would be uh, beyond the ground. In total, we had about 30,000 troops under us, so 20,000 Marines approximately, and then we joined about 10,000 uh, British forces again in June 1st when we started to morph into becoming RC Southwest. I never want to correct you tomorrow, but uh, just, just, just one quick clarification was RC Southwest did not exist prior to 14 June 2010, and that's when we chopped away uh, from RC South. When I arrived there in March, I worked for British Two Star and did so for the first six weeks I was on the ground, and then, and then we, we changed into our into our own uh, our own command. I was replaced uh, three weeks ago by a, a, U, a U.S. MC1 a two star, and our force levels continue about where they are, about that, about, about, about 30,000 folks. In addition to Marines, we had the U.K. forces in there, as I said. We also had a, a battalion of Georgians who uh, fought very well for us. We had some Estonians, we had some Danes. On my staff was a full complement of NATO countries. I also had some UAE special forces, along with some Tongans, and some Bahrainians who provided uh, fixed site security for me at, at a couple of my camps. As I was leaving the, uh, leaving the area, uh, some historians came through to, to kind of write up a little background, and they asked me what would I, if I were, you know, when the book's written in 100 years, I wanted to name my chapter, and when I was over there, how would I, what would I put for as a title? And uh, I stole a phrase from Winston Churchill. I said, I, I didn't think that we were at the, you know, it wasn't the uh, beginning of the end, certainly over there, but it may have, been, in fact, have been the, uh, the end of the beginning. And I'll, and I'll talk about that as, as we walk through. Next slide. Again, the, the part of uh, the part of uh, Afghanistan that I was that I was concerned about, basically this area down here, over about to there, a small slice of Kandahar province, Nimruz province, which I'll talk about. You may find interesting uh, because it was so different from uh, from Helmand province. Helmand province was the focus of my efforts. About 1.5 million folks live there. About 1.4 of them live along the Helmand River, which runs from the northeast to the southwest and eventually flows out into uh, Iran. That's the key piece of terrain in the, in the entire district. The reason being is back in the 50s and 60s, the USAID folks built a, uh, they poured millions of dollars into, into Afghanistan and into Helmand province in particular, and built a large dam, the Kajaki Dam, up in the northeast uh, corner of the province. Those two things, one, it provides some electrical power, uh, mostly going to Kandahar, but second of all, it, it, it controls water for a very simple but very efficient uh, irrigation system that the Americans put in. And we were the beneficiaries of it uh, because the, the older people still remember the Americans very fondly. Remember what the Americans did in, in Helmand Province. And some of the old timers will show you pictures of back in the 60s of uh, a very American looking place where uh, ladies at the, uh, at the country club playing tennis and skirts and, and men walking around town and, you know, with shirts and ties on. And it was very much a... Uh, a little, they call it Little Americans at, at some point. Swimming pools, all that kind of stuff. That infrastructure still exists. It's run down, but it still exists. What the irrigation system did was turn the desert into a very, very rich agricultural area. Both sides of the river, and what's referred to as the green zones, about 10 kilometers in depth on either side of the river, is a very lush agricultural area that grows everything from uh, 
world-class pomegranates, and when you go to your store this time, please ask them and stock helmet pomegranates. Not those, not that junk that comes out of Kandahar and stuff, but they're real, they're real. real <laughs> um, peanuts, corn, potatoes, everything, all kind of root vegetables. It was the bread basket of Afghanistan and actually help uh, with their exports that went down into India and to Pakistan to help feed them. That's the good news. The bad news is it, it's ideal terrain to grow poppy. And poppy is the, uh, about 80% of the world's heroin comes out of it. Uh, and most of it comes out of Helmut Province. It's, it's a farmer's ideal product because basically in, in October, some guy knocks on your door and he hands you a big bag of seed. You take it out in the field, you throw it on the ground, it takes very little water, very little care, it blooms. And then in uh, April, May, you go out there and you harvest it. And then a guy shows up again in the middle of the night, take off this, this basically you, you squeeze sap out of the plant. Take that sap off your hand and give you a big bucket of money. So for the farmers, it's a great product. Of course, for the rest of the world, it's absolute uh, you know, poison. But that was one of the issues we had. That, that, that poppy crop funds the insurgency. That's where the Taliban gets his money from. Uh, for he, he, taxes the, he taxes the poppy crop as it comes out. That's his source of funding. We attack that from that perspective. I was not in the interdiction operations, nor was I involved in the counter drugs as such. But I did attack the poppy system where it crossed lines with the insurgency because it funded him so, so much. And, and we, we, anticipated, we estimated that in the year we were there, through interdiction methods and through taking over his places where he'd grown this stuff, we cut his operation, operating budget about in half. And we saw that impact on the battlefield. It had an impact on his ability to procure resources to keep the insurgency going. And we had, we had significant intelligence traffic that showed us he was in a, uh, he had a cash flow problem. He could not buy weapons. He couldn't pay his people. He was selling off. We had commanders selling off their cars in order to pay their troops. We saw it in him trying to uh, recycle explosives, going out, sending people out to the battlefield to dig up old IEDs and losing people to those explosions. Something he would not have done had he had a warehouse full of stuff. We saw it in his repackaging ammunition, and again, in his failure to begin to retract those $10 a day Taliban, the young, young unemployed men of, of Helmut Province who were doing it simply for a paycheck. Uh, as you note there, the Iranian border there with Nimruz province, I'll speak a little bit about that in a second. And of course, the uh, Helmut province borders Pakistan. Uh, it's a wide open border. I didn't have troops within about 75 miles of that border because uh, there's a large desert. And uh, the Pakistanis had very few troops, very few people were all up on that border. So that border was wide open. And it was a main source of, of the, uh, the lines of uh, supply that he used. Uh, the Helmut province, uh, 10,000 foot mountains to the north, the Hindu Kush is there. And it flows down to a very flat desert in the south. And that had some impact on our operation. This is the way we saw the battlefield. This is an unclassified slide. But uh, this is the way we saw the battlefield we got there. Obviously, red is bad, controlled by the enemy. Yellow is uh, uh, contested, probably leaning towards the Jaroa side. Green is good. Green is where the Jaroa is in, is in full, is in full uh, control. Uh, and you can, you can note the difference as I talk to, the, as I talk to those operations that we, that we conducted. The red blob down at the bottom is uh, Baram Cha. Kind of like the Star Wars uh, bar scene. It's an evil town. Nobody good lives there. Uh, it is where he tends his drugs, and, and it's where he buys his uh, buys his explosives, his weapons, his ammunition that goes north. We uh, we visited there twice, and we're there now. Uh, it, it is a long approach march, as you can see from the river where we keep our forces. But we hit him twice down there. One with a 48-hour raid, which took the bazaar down and disrupted his supply ability. And then the uh, second time was uh, just before we left, we went down there again. We were intending to stay there for about 60 days to not have the ability to use Baram Cha uh, after the poppy season is over, over this year. Um, and as you can see up towards Kajaki, which is up there in the northeast corner, again, our intent was to push this guy into the desert, push him into the mountains, separate him from the population, take away his support base, and then watch him, uh, watch him wither away. You know, there'll, there'll probably always be a few guys up in the mountains over there that are clinging to old ideas and think, the, and think you know, there's still communists in this world. You know, it's, it's, you're never going to clean this thing out probably in Toto. But what you have to do is eliminate his ability to impact on the government of Afghanistan. And that was, our, that was the, uh, the way in which we attacked the station. Sir, do you say you currently have forces down there in the, in yes. the uh, southeast corner? We do. No, right down here. Right there. Right there. Are you right. going to keep them there? Uh, no, they're going to withdraw after about 60 days. Yeah. Um, they, there needs to be somebody down there permanently at some point. That's probably a, a year out or so. So battalion size? It's battalion size. Yeah. Battalion size. But that was a, when we took that place down, a very traditional battle that anybody would have, I mean, he had minefields, he had fighting positions, he had inter interlocking fields of fire, he had prepared bunkers, he had a reserve to, uh, to counterattack during the breakthrough. And we attacked it the same way you'd attack it out at, North, at, at the, uh, the training areas uh, out in California. Mm -hmm. we, we blew a line charge, 
broke a hole in the in the uh, in the minefield, pushed uh, armored bulldozers through that, followed through with troops. Uh, we had uh, B-1 bombers and driving uh, close air support for us. Uh, it was it was a very traditional uh, set piece battle, if you will, and one that he lost pretty badly at. As I told the, the general earlier, he fled into Pakistan. So when we went back down there again. We knew he would he would use Pakistan, use the border as, as a defensive uh, measure. It only made common sense. So we made liaison with the Pakistani army prior to our second attack, talked to them, briefed them on the plan, and got their permission to, to engage targets uh, that lit up over in, uh, over in Pakistan. And uh, the enemy, we, of course, listened to his chatter on the, on the radios, was quite surprised when he activated his mortars that we were able to, uh, to bring air support in on right immediately on top of them, and, uh, and it was quite surprising that we were allowed to fire into Pakistan. But again, we did that with full approval of the Pakistani army, their full cooperation, and received uh, not a single uh, complaint afterwards, either of civilian casualties or the fact that we were firing across the border. So there is there is close cooperation that goes on with the with the Pakistanis, and, and it was it was it was helpful. To us. And did you have journalists embedded with you in that fight? Because I, we I did think, not. We did I, not. I don't think that story has been told no, at we, all. We did not. We did not have journalists embedded with us in that fight. How many U.S. casualties? Zero. Two, I'm sorry. Two. We had two broke. We had a broken arm. Uh, when a, a vehicle went into, but there's no roads from where that kind of that the Liver Rhine is down south. There's really no real roads. It's rough terrain, and we lost a. We had a vehicle tip over and God broke his arm, and uh, we had a special forces guy that uh, shot himself in the in the leg uh, as he jumped out of a helicopter, and uh, he got a, he got around and discharged and went into his uh, his upper leg, his real upper leg. Is don't go any further up than where he shot himself. But uh, he was fine. He got both of those guys in the back. They lost uh, the first time we counted 75 casualties, the second time we counted about 50 casualties. He defended hard, but then he, then he was hurt. Yeah. It, was, uh, it, was, it was done very well by not, you know, I had no plan, but it was, it was the, uh, the young Marines on the, on the, on the ground. Uh, and I, I tell you the story of the young Marines, I, I, my, my staff is tired of hearing this story, but the first attack going down, one of the key pieces was to breach his, breach his minefield and get through his minefield. So our plan was to at dawn, throw a line charge, which is an explosive rope, as you know, blow that up, which clears most of the mines, because it's a very narrow gap that you have to come through with two hills, and then pull an armored bulldozer through there to clear that, and it's in the vehicles in right after it. Halfway down, the general makes a great plan, the colonels think it's an even better plan, the major's got this thing locked down in concrete, and halfway down, the, the, the one vehicle that's carrying my armored bulldozer breaks, gets stuck in the sand. Trying to extract it, snaps an axle. Now we're really screwed. And we're probably still 50 miles north of the bridge, and uh, so everybody's on the radio. You know, wow, you know, so you're, you're familiar with that confusion. Uh, an E3 Lance Corporal walks up, hops on the back of the vehicle, starts the bulldozer up, backs it off of the low boy that's carrying the vehicle, and asks the gunny who's standing, "Hey, which way?" The gunny points south. The guy takes it off at about three kilometers an hour driving this thing, and sure enough, as the sun came up, bulldozer comes over the hill. Boom! The line charge goes. He pushes through, and uh, you know. For want of a nail, uh, that was successful, and for want of a lance corporal, the mission was successful. But those are, you know, so, so little guys that make a difference, as you know, in a, in a, in a firefight. Just, just a comment, if I could add there, I think it's very interesting, particularly those that are have not been in the military, to, to listen to what doesn't sound like a counterinsurgency trained force have, having to deal with this kind of fight inside of a counterinsurgency campaign. So those conventional combined arms maneuver skills are still really, really important down there at the grassroots level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sir, with Please. If I may, Please. this story needs to get told, and, and whoever that battalion commander is needs to write this thing up. And this this would be good for the Department of Defense, and good for the nation, and good for those troopers. They certainly deserve to be told. a great job. And as I said, I'd like to kind of point it out, there is some concern that our, that our, that our traditional military skills have eroded over the years to take artillery battalions and make them security forces and, and take other people and make them you know, civil affairs officers. And uh, it, it's pleasant to see that you still can call in close air support, you can still mark targets. For those of you who haven't been able to do the traditional things you expect young officers and young, and young uh, Marines to do, and uh, and do do very very well, uh, we would have lived in a passing grade out at the uh, out at the National Training Center. I think uh, had we had we done that attack under supervision. Um, and in all in all honesty, one of the reason one of the reasons there was an embedded journalist was I was concerned about the complexity of it, and I was concerned about uh, a few other things, especially the Pakistani border. And so I, I kind of. Kept this line away from us, you know, the Afghan security forces, which is, which is I think, critical. That's our, this is our ticket home. Uh, yeah, we had the 215th Corps in our zone, a new corps, started in March when we got there. It now has three brigades, uh, all three of whom are capable of semi-independent operations. Uh, we support them with mentorship teams, uh, but they, uh, they do all their own planning and execution, and we, have, we give them uh, close air support, which they don't have, even some comm capability, which they really don't need. They, 
they tend to go to cell phones when they get when they get in a fight, uh, and, and give them some uh, some maintenance support. Although they take take most of that maintenance on for themselves, and give them medevac so they have the same medevac capability that we have on, on our side to give them a feel. Just just real quick, you know, there are troops like any other troops. Uh, we got there over 20% UA problems. The guys go home. Most of them are from northern Afghanistan. The southern Pashtuns don't join the army. We're working at. Uh, when we got the mentorship teams in place, we checked around and found out why were these guys going home and staying home. It was real easy. They were, it, it, as, as rural as that place is, they get paid electronically. They get transferred money into an account. And they, each of them, you know, they can't read and write, has a little plastic card. They need that to transfer their money so their families can, can get access to their, to their money. They didn't have that capability. We got the banks, the Bank of Kabul, and then later the uh, Z's Bank to get down and give us that capability and to bring army camps. Once we did that, we cut our UA rates. Uh, we found out the leave policy. Unauthorized absence. Unauthorized absence, I apologize. That's a guy going home and not coming back. Uh, we found out that they weren't getting authorized leave. They weren't being allowed to go home. And they, like, they also like to fight cycles. They like to come and fight for a while, train for a while, fight for a while, and then they want to go home on leave and see their families. It, it's just the way, that's just the way they operate. We found out they didn't have a good policy to do that. The officers were all getting lots of leave. They were getting to go home lots. Um, but the trooper on the ground wasn't getting leave, and they didn't really, they couldn't account for it. So working with them to get them in a, a way to get their people together on a fair and equal basis and get them home the way they expected to, the UA, the unauthorized absence dropped from 20% to under 9%. Uh, it's pretty significant. Again, they go, they leave the same reason Marines leave. They're not getting paid, they're not getting fed, they live in the crummy quarters, and they, and they'll get, you know, they can't get off, uh, they can't get off the, uh, off the, off the reservation once in a while, they go home. So we found out, you know, soldiers and Marines are the same the world over. And that's, that's kind of what we worked on. For the police force, again, uh, three levels of cops, and I can talk to you any detail you want on that, but uniform police, that's the, that's, the, that's the city police at each place. Again, by training them, by enforcing literacy standards, and to be a police officer in the Helmand province, you have to have a third grade education, and I couldn't find enough of it. I couldn't find 7,500 guys that had that kind of education. So we offered them basic training in addition to learning police skills, literacy skills, and more probably more importantly, ethos training, in a protect and serve mentality uh, to, 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 to deprive them of that, of that kind of, you know, thuggery that they, that they were sometimes accused of. That good leadership that was brought in uh, by the Afghans, and we saw a huge increase in their capabilities. In Marja, and I tell the story, last time I visited Marja, you saw the fighting that was going on. There's now a crossroads in Marja, kind of right, the, right near the main bazaar, and there's a police officer. You used to have to duck across. Last summer you had to run across with your helmet down as guys fired over your heads. Uh, last time I was there, I crossed the street against the police officers. He was directing traffic, and he wanted to ticket me for being a jaywalker. And I, I tried to explain to him who I was, but, you know, he said, hey, you jaywalked. Uh, <laughs> so I told him, hey, I have to go back there in two months and pay my traffic fine, I guess. But I thought I was in Myrtle Beach on spring break or something. But again, the, 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 the increase in their professionalism and capability it was remarkable. And, and again, our, our policy, reduce that, reduce that insurgency capability, raising uh, the capability of the Afghan security forces. And when those two bars cross, you're ready, you're ready to begin thinking about transition. And my job was to set the conditions for transition, not to make the decisions. Although one of our districts was in fact included in the first tranche of, of uh, districts to be. Task Force Nimruz is, 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 is of interest. I talked about Nimruz province to my west. Entirely different world over there. About a half a million people live there. They're all focused around the city of Zaranj, which is on the Iranian border. And Zaranj, you go to Zaranj, it's it's a it's a modern third world city. There are there are malls, indoor malls that are air conditioned. The governor has put a swimming pool in his complex. Uh, women walking around the streets. Uh, the shops are open. Hardball roads. They get they get steady uh, water and electricity coming in from Iran. Uh, and they have a, a crossing a border crossing point which generates an awful lot of money. For the, uh, for the for the government, it's a uh, and there is no threat. Sorry. There's a very very little insurgency there. They have a good police force, and uh, they have some bandits kind of hang up in the north. But that's a, that's about it. Overall, it is a benign area. I had very few troops in there for two reasons: one, no need; but two, I was concerned about the Iranian border, and certainly didn't want to uh, you know cause an international incident by having uh, Iranian force my my forces approach it. I did for it. This is one of my failures, I think. I, I, we did form Task Force Nimru, which I thought the civilian side would jump all over. And I saw this as basically based around development and, uh, and governance. And all the governance piece is pretty, it's pretty good as well. But around development, and I thought the civilians would take the lead on this, and that I could just provide a small military force to do mentorship for the police department, and uh, let them do, take, you know, run with the ball. Now, I never really caught fire, I, never, I could never sell that idea. 
uh, I thought this was the future of what we have in Afghanistan after we after we start to off ramp our troops, and I just couldn't I couldn't sell it. But um, as you can see, we, we did some minor we did some they had contractors down there. We were able to contract the improvements on their airstrip. Uh, we spent about a million bucks of my CERT money to uh, work on their uh, canal. They had a canal which had run down. We fixed that up. Um, and we did some things like well, supported their youth shore, and you can see the girls there, which is very unusual. And we also worked with them in you know, like destroying ordnance that they had seas coming across from Iran. So all that, all that was, I think, I think that's the future, personally, of, of, of if you look two, three, four years down the road, of what we ought to be looking at to have at each one of the uh, perfect. We're almost finished here. I had a, a very good female officer, I had a lot of good female officers on my staff, a lot of good females on my staff, on my, on my, my unit. But uh, we took one and made her the gender advisor because there's a, about 50% of the population over there we had no access to, uh, the Afghan women. Again, a very rural, fundamental uh, society, which you know, they, they were very, very they're rooted in doing things in a certain way. We did, although you have some educated, some educated ladies, three of them sat on the provincial council in Helmand Province, but the majority of them were really very much, um, uh, we couldn't get to them. We just couldn't, we couldn't deal with them. I, I, my personally never ever, other than those three, I probably never spoke to an Afghan. An Afghan woman in the year that I was there. I visited an Afghan school one time and the teacher actually turned her back on me and kind of talked in the corner over her shoulder at me because that's just the way it is over there. But we worked at it. We, we, we formed these uh, female engagement teams which were very, very effective. Three or four or five uh, junior females, junior Marines and, and sailors. Uh, some of them had Pashtun and, and Dari capabilities. Most didn't, but we had a female interpreter with them. We sent them out. Their job was to engage the females to find out what it is we could do for the Afghan females that, that could, uh, you know, bring long-term benefit to the population. They did two things. First of all, I think they instructed very indirectly as to uh, the, the role of Western females. And they would come to town, embedded in a Marine patrol, helmets on, flak jackets on, carrying a weapon, obviously, full, or carrying all the gear that a Marine on patrol carries. Uh, when they would arrive to hold their meetings, the surest, as they say over there, of course, they, we all take our helmets off and drop our flak jackets to show that we feel safe. It became evident who was a female and who was a male. And the Afghan men were absolutely uh, amazed that we would have girls uh, out there doing, doing that kind of work. Even more amazing to them was when, of course, rank structure exists. So when you'd have a female sergeant give an order to a, a male corporal, the male corporal would carry out his instructions. I mean, that's, that's the way we operate. No, nothing, nothing surprising there. Fascinating to the Afghan men. Fascinating to the Afghan men. And then we would get access to the Afghan the ladies, you know, the female engagement would get into the compounds, sit down, talk to the uh, talk to the uh, wives and mothers, and find out what it is we can do that would that would you know help them out. Two things they're interested in: uh, education for the children. That was their number one requirement. And the second was uh, health care, especially female health care and uh, midwifery and things like that. That allowed us to structure some classes that we were teaching that get some midwifery uh, things out there. Allowed us to give some classes to the local uh, ladies on, on female health issues, and again. Gave them access and a chance to talk and to vent, and that was all carried back. We weren't there gathering intelligence as much as we were gathering information that we could then use in the coin fight to, uh, to influence, again, what it, what, what it was one. You know, the men would want us to build tea shops so they could sit around in the shade and drink tea, and, and the, the ladies were more, more interested in their well, closer to the village or closer to their house, so they didn't have to walk so far to draw water every day. Um, a big, big step. Of course, trying to find female teachers was, was very, very difficult for us. Very, very few ladies were qualified to teach. We worked with them on that. The other thing we found was uh, they all had radios, like listen to radios, music, and that kind of thing. And we were able to institute a pilot program of teaching uh, how to read by radio. Tell the lady, we give them books, open, they, could, they, they could turn the radio on at 7 o'clock in the evening, listen to a class on how to read and write, and uh, we'll see if that works. It may or it may not, but it's, it's again, a, a, a chance to open that education process up. The mission was to provide freedom of movement throughout the province. You know, people traditionally look at freedom of movement as roads, the ability to drive around. We worked very hard at that, safety of the roads and the installation of, of, of a good road system. And we, we made some real progress. I was very pleased to find out in, in uh, January, the governor said, he told his people, every, anybody who worked for him, worked for him would no longer fly in marine helicopters from place to place, but would drive from place to place. A huge step in road security and road availability. The uh, night before the Marja election, the governor had some questions. He wanted to make sure the election was going to go all right. He got in his car in last car and drove about 40 miles over to Marja uh, in the middle of the night. Met with the uh, met with the uh, uh, governor of, of Marja. They discussed uh, the election. They went and had dinner together in a local restaurant. Then they, and the governor got back in his car and drove back to last car again in the middle of the night. 
If he'd done that last July, he'd, he'd have found his head in the side of the road. Now he's able to travel around and move around like that. And again, that opens up that freedom because the people, the, the people love to travel. They love to get in cars. They're always driving around. The other part of that, in addition to freedom of movement, was we thought freedom of movement of ideas. Uh, we wanted to make get it. We think that's the real future in, in that country, to be able to move ideas. That, that's what's going to develop these folks. I talked about the education process. That was one of them. Uh, they, they all have cell phones. We uh, worked at getting in the Taliban controls the cell phones. They control the cell phone towers through threats against the, uh, the national companies up in uh, Kabul. So we, 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 and then working with the Army, put in a system down in south that, of our own cell phone towers so that we can be able to buy them with 24-7 coverage and eliminate whatever it is the, the Taliban think they're going to gain by turning off the cell towers, which I think is just simply an exercise in power as opposed to any, having any meaning, meaningful role. We had movement of that. Uh, radio in a box worked out very well for us. Now, they all have radios, as I said. We, we, we used that to pass public information, and that got us in front of the suitcase issues. Uh, music was played, entertainment shows. They love soap operas. Um, I used to meet with the mullahs, every, which are the religious leaders, every, uh, every month. And they would come in. We'd have a big meeting, have lunch, and talk. And uh, we gave them about an hour a day for prayer on the radio. So we had this we had this meeting and they, they, they said to me they, they said that was not enough time they needed more time right they wanted 24 7 religious radio broadcast uh, I, said, well, I said well let me let me look at them so we, we put together a list a poll that we took out to the villages and passed around and said what do you want to hear on the radio we had about 15 different items everything from music to soap operas to you know gardening advice uh public service announcements and and prayer was in there when i got the results back uh, prayer came in 15th. So I had to have this other meeting with the Mullahs explaining to them that, you know, I think we're about right where we want to be. We don't want to change the programming here a whole bunch. And, um, but again, it's a, uh, it's, 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 it's a way of getting to, of touching the people, getting out to all of them, including the ladies in the home who listen to the radio very religiously. And uh, I can use that term, but using it very much. <laughs> we also work with the media. We also work with the media, uh, an Afghan media, which became pretty independent and pretty aggressive. And, uh, and, uh, and they helped us at times. Other times they reported things that went wrong. So uh, again, a free independent media, which we felt was, was, was pretty good shape, both, both radio, TV, and the print, although the print didn't really have a whole lot of impact, obviously, in, in Helmand in Province. 